to, uh, to ask about or anything that seems relevant, please get in contact with us. We're more than happy to, uh, to continue the discussion. Okay, uh, all right, so starting with the market update. So what's been happening? Uh, last week, we actually looked like we were gonna have a strong week on the market with uh, some recovery and some announcements that were made. And then on lunchtime on Friday, I guess, um, it just decided that was enough and it just slowly dropped away until there was a net gain of basically nothing. Uh, I guess that, that's nice. It feels like there's a little bit of stability there, um, but um, that's not the story on a day-to-day -day basis or even in the middle of the day. So if you are watching, uh, which I recommend you don't do, uh, then what you'll see is that the market can go up three or five percent in the in at the start of the day and then it can drop by seven or ten um, th that volatility is here and it's likely to stay for for at least a little while um, so why is it here there's two reasons the first one is uh, is a completely irrational issue and that is that um, there's a lot of fear about and hurting and, and you only have to look as far as toilet paper to see the way that um, people are scared about what's going on at the moment so um, if if the market starts to fall, then a lot of people will think, oh, uh, this is we're in for we're in for bad times. We better sell and we better get out, and that can push the prices lower. Uh, the problem with that is that um, it's impossible to know whether it's a short-term fall and it's going to bounce back straight away. In which case, the people who have got out of the market have made a big mistake, uh, or whether it's going to continue falling um, and um, the people who got out have somehow managed to make a great decision. Uh, the issue of course for us is that um, that is akin to gambling and we're not prepared to do that with our money. We're not prepared to do that with your money. So we come back to those philosophies that we spoke about in the last meeting. Uh, but there is, aside from that, there is a genuine unknown about what's happening in the economy and um, specifically to the companies that make up the share market. So what, what do we think is actually going to happen? Well, we listen to a lot of different people and there are a lot of different opinions. Uh, so all we can provide is what we think is, is what we would call best guesses. Um, so when we look at what should happen to the price of a company or what should happen to the share market, we go back to what they call rational economic theory. And the problem with that is that two of those words are not really in play at the moment. Theory is not really working, this is something completely new, and there's not a lot of rational people at the moment who are making decisions to buy or sell. But if we're looking to see what, uh, what is likely to happen, that's what, we, that's what we go back to. So if we're looking to see what a company should be worth, we either look at what money they're making right now, so their current profitability and their ability to pay dividends to their shareholders, uh, and we look at the future profitability. So that means that companies that um, are investing in themselves and not penalised, um, and companies, you know, like mining companies that um, haven't yet dug out of the ground whatever it is that they're going to sell, um, can still, it, there's, there's still a recognition that, that it will make money in the future. So they're the two areas that um, should determine what a share price should be. Uh, if we have a look at what happened in on the Australian share market from uh, basically all of 2019 and up to the peak um, a, a month or two later, then the share price went. The share prices went up about 26%. The earnings didn't go up by 26%. The earnings actually came down for the majority of those companies. So that tells us a couple of things. One is that maybe the share price grew more than perhaps it should. And maybe that, um, that hurting behavior was happening because the market was strong and people wanted to get into it. So it pushed it higher than perhaps it should have been. But it also um, is due to, I guess, um, an issue with low interest rates. So people wanting to move to a better return. Um, but um, there was definitely in, a, in amongst that last 12 months, uh, there were companies that did, did have great future growth prospects and their price, share price went up. Um, but that's what's happened over the last 12 months. If we look to see what's happened over the last month, then what has actually happened is the share price, and this is to the 20th of March, so the share price came down for companies as a whole, the ASX 200, by 32%. Their earnings didn't really change at all. So that tells us that really that doesn't make sense. But we've got the issue of the economy shutting down for a period 
and companies not being able to trade or make any money. So their earnings will reduce. So the question is, we're trying to figure out how much should they reduce by and you know, is the share market with its returns to date reasonable? Um, so we've got lots of analysts and economists that we listen to and the consensus is that based on where we are at the moment and how we're treating the virus and how other countries have dealt with it, um, that where the companies are likely to see about a 25% decline in their earnings. So a very simple look at those numbers suggests that, well, maybe the share market has gone down a lot further than it should have. Um, the issue, of course, is that we're dealing with a lot of unknowns. So when we're talking about whether these companies are going to make money, we're not actually sure when the majority of them are going to open back up again. Uh, but I guess the purpose of, of this graph, and it's the only one I'll show you because um, I don't want to put you to sleep this early in the morning, is that we do have, um, you know, we've, it's reasonable that the share prices have dropped. Um, exactly how much they drop by is the question. And um, based on our best guesses at the moment, um, it, it, and we've had some recovery since the 20th of March, uh, but it does seem reasonable that, um, you know, we're, we're in roughly in the right area with some hope for a rebound over the course of the year. But I have to put that huge disclaimer is that there's a lot more we need to find out over the coming weeks. Okay, uh, so what's the government doing? So um, hopefully you've received uh, an email from us that went through all of the initiatives, the stimulus packages. The third one was only uh, just recently announced. Um, if you read all of that, uh, then my hat's off to you because that was a fairly long email. So the idea here is that we're just gonna try and pick out some of the key points um, and then you know gloss over some of the things that probably aren't as relevant. So uh, what did the government do? Uh, they've made some changes to Super. They have made some changes to Centrelink. Um, and so Super and Centrelink is what we'll spend the majority of time talking about. In terms of uh, Centrelink, one area that we don't go into a lot of detail is that they made a change to the income test and the deeming rules. Uh, that change, uh, that's basically where they say, they look at the money you've got in the bank and um, potentially other assets. And they say, well, we're going to assume that you earn a certain amount on that money, even if you don't actually earn that amount. And for the last few years, it's been ridiculously high compared to what you could actually get in the bank. So what they've done is they've reduced that to make it you know, a little more reasonable with what you can actually get if you put your money in the bank. That change um, is the right thing to do, but it's not going to have a huge impact. So for the 500,000 people on the age pension that that change will impact, the average additional payment is $100 a year. So that particular one, you know, we could go over that. Um, it's not gonna make a huge difference to anyone really. And to be honest, it feels like it is the right thing to do, but it's a better political headline than it is actually giving money to people. And they've done, but that's not to say that they're not doing that in other areas. Um, okay, so, uh, and then there are a series of measures for business and employers and now employees with the last, the last announcement. Um, that, um, we're not gonna talk about that in detail, but um, you might have uh, kids that that relates to, that that's important to. Um, so um, that email that we sent out has got all of those details. Basically what the government's doing is that first step was, okay, we need to st stimulate the economy. So they said, okay, we'll give some money out. Second one, they said, actually, actually, it's probably not enough. So we're gonna give more money out um, and we're gonna help people who are unemployed. And then they realized that um, they wanna keep businesses going at the end of this. So they wanna keep people employed, not just receiving money to then go and look for jobs. They want them to go back into the jobs they had. So that's the third stimulus package that they'd announced. Okay, so changes to super. First thing is that they've given people the ability to access super. I wasn't sure if this would get through because the Labor government weren't big fans of this particular policy, um, given that the idea is that you access this money is available for retirement. But the, the, the result here is that you can get 10 grand tax free this financial year and 10 grand next financial year tax free. Whether or not it's a good idea to take that money is a different issue, especially if the market's just come down, it might actually sort of be the worst time to take it out. Um, but the money's there and if you need it, um, that's 
what the government's doing, they're allowing you to get access to it. Um, how do you get access to it? You've got to apply through MyGov, your MyGov account, which is going to be difficult for some people, and it's through the ATO. Um, so you don't actually go to your super fund, uh, but what you need, do need to do is that you need to make sure that the super fund has your bank details and your ID. Otherwise, they won't know how to give you the money. Uh, to be eligible, you need to be unemployed, um, eligible for job seeker, which is the new name for new start allowance or parenting payment, um, or after January made redundant or reduced your working hours or your turnovers reduced. So the idea there is that um, they're just saying, look, if you're struggling, you can get some money out of super. The good news is that it's tax free. The bad news is that it's potentially a bad time to take it out. But if it's a last resort, um, you know, there's a lot of people will access it. Uh, okay, second thing, and, and this is probably a lot more relevant to our retired clients is that they've changed the minimum amount you're forced to take out of your pension. For a lot of our clients, um, this wouldn't normally be something that you'd worry too much about because you take out what you need. Uh, but given that things have slowed down, close, you know, businesses have shut, you may have the, op the opportunity to spend a little less and therefore leave that money in the pension for it to grow. So they have reduced the max, the, the minimum amount that you must take out of your pension for this financial year and next financial year by half. So that applies to account-based pensions, which if you've been a client for a while, you would probably still hear us calling them allocated pensions, uh, transition to retirement pensions and term allocated pensions. Most of our clients would have your standard account-based pension. Um, some who are still working would have transition to retirement pensions and a very small number who set up these pensions prior to 2007 would have term allocated pensions. So the, for allocated pensions, and this is what the majority of clients will have, you've got the ability to halve the amount that you're drawing. Now, what that really means is that you could, if you're receiving your income each fortnight, month, or, or anything less than annually, you could actually stop your payments for the remainder of the year. Now that's great if you've got cash and you've got enough money to be able to do that. Um, but, um, uh, and if you do contact uh, your super fund director, obviously we would like to help with that, but we have had some clients that contact the super fund direct. It is important to confirm whether you want to have the payment stopped completely or whether you would just like the new lower amount to continue for the remainder of the financial year. Uh, but that, that does give an opportunity to leave money in the fund and to therefore buy more time before you potentially have to sell growth assets like shares and property. Um, okay. Um, so tax-free payments. So the government is trying to keep the economy going, stimulate the economy. So uh, the first thing that they're doing is that there is a $750 payment for each person or $1,500 for a couple if you're receiving an eligible payment or concession card. I've listed them all there. There's a lot. Um, well, sorry, that's not all of them. There are actually some more. But um, for the majority of people, it's, it's a pension. Um, it's an allowance. It's a pension, a concession card, or a Commonwealth Seniors healthcare card, and also uh, DVA clients aren't, aren't forgotten as well. Um, the most important thing to realise is that it's $750 per person, not per payment. So if you happen to be receiving carer's allowance, as well as carer payment, um, or age pension, or a new start allowance, then they will only pay you $750 for one payment, not for both of them. You won't get you know, double the amount. Um, you must reside in Australia. It might surprise you to know, but we do actually have a couple of clients who are still receiving the age pension and live overseas. They won't receive this payment. Uh, the first payment will be made from today. Don't know when it will, you'll actually receive it, but they'll be made from today. And in order to receive that first payment, if you are still applying for a benefit, then um, you, as long as you get your application in by the 13th of April, then you can still um, receive this first payment. The second payment will come from the 13th of July. Um, so that's just, an, uh, with, that's just the government saying, look, here's some money, we'd like you to go and spend it to keep the economy ticking along. 
Uh, okay, the next thing that they released was called the coronavirus supplement. So this, um, this is an amount that will be paid with what was previously called New Start Allowance and is now called Job Seeker Allowance. It, um, these individuals will only receive the first $750 payment. So if you're, if you're on New Start Allowance, which is now called Job Seeker, you receive the first $750 payment as a one-off, but then for six months at, that's been announced at the moment, could be longer, there's an additional payment of $550 per fortnight on top of the standard payment, which will be somewhere between $500 and $600, depending on whether you're a single person or in a couple. Um, and uh, so it sort of makes sense that you don't get the second 750 payment because you're getting an additional 550 per fortnight over that period. Um, they are waiving the asset test. They've just announced that they're increasing the amount a partner can earn while still being able to receive this payment. So generally speaking, if you had a partner working, um, they couldn't earn really more than about $48,000, $50,000 a year before your payment was impacted. They've increased that up to 70 odd. Um, so uh, there's some, yeah, there's a, a bit of, bit of mo movement there to, to recognize that some people um, who, you know, ordinary, ordinarily wouldn't receive this payment are now gonna, gonna get it. Um, and they have waived some of the waiting periods uh, because there are waiting periods to move on to allowances, which don't really apply for pensions. But interestingly, the one they didn't waive was your annual leave. So if you finish up and you receive annual leave, let's say you receive three months worth of annual leave, then um, you have to wait basically, depending on how much you're earning, but 99% of the time, three months before you can receive your first payment. Uh, they didn't waive that. So um, that's, that's a bit of a shame, but I guess that rule is simply designed to make you use up, use up that leave. Um, they're encouraging it that uh, any lodgement be done through MyGov, and that's simply because, uh, as you would all know, it's harder and harder to deal with Centrelink these days. They don't have, the staff numbers aren't there. And um, if they can try and centralize and automate, then they will. Um, we um, are still helping our clients apply for these payments um, because it's a lot easier for them. Uh, but we do always warn that it can take a little bit longer than if you went direct and did it through my dog. Uh, and um, you're eligible for the coronavirus supplement, supplement if you're receiving one of these payments. Really, um, it's, it's the, uh, the new start allowance, which is now called Job Seeker, which is the most relevant there. Um, okay, so um, our thoughts. Um, so if you get, you get those funds in, don't be afraid to spend it. Um, that's what the money has been given for and uh, that's gonna be good for the economy. If, um, if everyone does that, that's obviously gonna be a challenge given that uh, a lot of places are, um, uh, are, are shut down for a, for a period. Um, if, if you do find that you're spending less um, and your cost, cost of living is reduced, then um, absolutely, it's not a bad idea to reduce the amount you're drawing from your pension. We um, make an effort to structure everyone's portfolio as much as we can with money and cash. If you were on the last webinar, then Gil would have explained uh, how, we, how we look to see your spending. Uh, for the next year or two and then we put that money into cash and then you know we have we step up in terms of uh, the risk uh, so that we we've got plenty of money in safe assets that um, that philosophy is working absolutely right now and we're not recommending any clients sell from growth assets uh, but if um, if you can reduce the payments that you're drawing then it just gives you even more time before you potentially have to access those growth assets and gives them the chance to, to bounce back up. Um, and probably the most important thing is um, to stay invested where possible. Um, so we would love to be able to tell you exactly um, where the market's gonna go. Um, and uh, I probably borrowed this one from Gil a long time ago, but if we knew that, um, then we'd be flying around in gold-plated helicopters and um, you know we'd, we'd own the island wherever it was that we were sitting on and um, we wouldn't be here. Um, but the end result is that no one really knows. Uh, people can be lucky. 
um, and uh, and that's taking risks that we wouldn't take with your money or with ours. So the most important thing um, in these times is to um, a ask us any questions that you have, um, and and to hold on and stay invested because um, the market has always recovered, um, and it's just a question of how long that will take. And I suppose uh, if there are any questions, please uh, punch them in now. But um, one of the uh, most famous investors in the world, Warren Buffett, uh, is, um, has got a great quote, which says, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And I think that um, uh, if, you're, if you're still working and you've got the ability to keep contributing to super, you're buying in while it's low. If you're retired, then the key is simply not uh, not selling when it's low and making sure that um, uh, that your portfolio is structured to allow that to happen because we know that you'll need an income and uh, we make sure that that's, that that's covered in those safer, safer assets. Uh, Gil, any questions? Uh, we've, we've got one from Mick. There's a couple of things I did want to mention. Chris, thank you very much. Um, please to everybody, pop the questions in here. We're trying to... Um, to do what we can to help you understand things. So the more you uh, the more you ask questions, the better it's going to be for everybody. So Mick uh, Gallagher, go ahead, Mick. Are you in Are you in Australia still, or did you make it to to, to France? <laughs> Tell me after. Um, Mick's asked a question. It goes basically: the Australian government's doing a good job, which I agree they are, uh, and making some strong moves. But Mick's worried that the US and others may suffer because they haven't acted early enough. So will that impact on us and will they drag us down no matter what we do? My my answer to that is is twofold. A, we don't have the crystal ball. B, I don't think it will. Okay. The um I've got some slides that I might drag up here, Chris, if I can maybe grab at some point. Every single curve around the world of the COVID-19 infections is flattening right now. There is not one that's getting worse, they're all getting better, including the US. The US has only just started to get better. With the, the graph Chris showed earlier uh, of market performance, we've been talking to virtually every client over the last year or so saying, look, it's been running hot for the last decade. We think we're in for a lean period, but history has taught us that um, we can't tell you when to get in and out and trying to be too clever there means you'll end up losing money, you won't make it. So our, our view was that if we look at those figures that suggest we're down 25 or 30%, seriously, I think 10 to 15% of that was coming anyway. It was going to happen anyway. The, uh, Cause the market was running hot and it was overheated. The other 15% is a result of the fear and uncertainty around the virus. Uh, and what that's going to do to the economy. Now, in and of itself, the graphs Chris showed earlier are right, but definitely there are businesses that are struggling and they're going to be losing money. That's going to affect the next three to six months. From about the three month mark onwards though, the actions that the government are taking in terms of injecting capital into the, into the market, injecting money into business, injecting money into the, into the um, individuals through the Centrelink distributions and things like that, and the job seeker allowances and so forth. That's going to have a very real effect and it will have an effect before Christmas. So I think intuitively we need to look at the stock market decline as having two elements. One, it was coming anyway, 10 to 15%, and the best result there is to stay with it. The second one is the fear and uncertainty around the, um, the virus itself, and that one should recover. And again, you know, all care, but we don't control these things. I will be very, very, very surprised if we don't see a 10 to 15% recovery in the market before Christmas. Because, and I'll see if Chris, I can drag this slide over here um, and I'll try to take control of the screen. Um, how do I do that? I'm gonna stop your sharing, Chris, and I'm gonna- I was, I was hoping you would know the answer to that, Gil. Yep, I'm still learning here. Um, so, I've got, to, if you can just give me a minute, share screen. Um, and that's, that's it, I've, not, not that one. That's the graph I want. Um, here it is, now here it is. So I'm just gonna share this track. You got it. Does everyone's got it? 
So these are all the countries around the world at the moment that are, um, you still got the graph on the screen? Chris? Uh, yeah, I, I've, um, I can see your, your screen, yes. Okay, so that's just the confirmed cases. Um, you can see here that these, these graphs show the trajectory of the COVID-19 infections all around the world. China's completely flatlined. South Korea is basically flatlined. Italy has started to, to, to improve. Spain is on the same trajectory. Germany's doing the same thing. Australia is um, heading in the same direction. Each and every one of these graphs have the same characteristic. It slows down and it slows down and sort of flatlines fairly quickly because of the social distancing measures. Now, the US, you can tell that they were slow to move. Donald Trump is Donald Trump. He decided it wasn't a risk um, and I think he was wrong. The, but the curve has started to improve there. So what you're going to see is hopefully by the time we get to the, this is a, a period of two months, but the majority, um, the majority of this disaster sort of happens in a three or four week period. If they do the social distancing thing, then things will recover and the infection rate will slow down dramatically. So once, if you look at what's going on in China, I was listening to a podcast about it this morning. China's pretty much opening up for business now. People can go back into Hubei presence, uh, province and to Wuhan. They're not allowed out yet, but they should be within two weeks. So functionally, China got this thing under control within about 40 or 50 days. They waited another 40 or 50 days to say, yes, we've beaten it. So what this thing looks like, if you're talking about China or South Korea, is a 100-day to 200-day worst-case cycle before business starts again. Now, when that happens, I think we're going to see the second half of the stock market downturn recover quite quickly, which is the fear and uncertainty question Chris was talking about. So that's the first one. Um, we, uh, we, we've got the natural you know, negative market that was expected after 10 years. And then we've got the fear-based one around COVID-19. I think we're going to see by June, a very strong sentiment change in this country um, and the majority of Europe. But you can see here again, I didn't pick out the United Kingdom, but you can see here that it's really improved as well. And even Iran, which is one of the hotspots, its curve has changed dramatically as well, let alone France and Germany and Spain and Italy and so forth. So to, to Mick, I, I hope that answers that question. That This thing is a probably a three-month phenomenon in each individual economy. There will be two types of recovery that happen. There will be the immediate sentiment-based recovery as everybody thinks, oh, good, it's happening again. Stock market starts to move positively. And then there will be the okay, what's the real damage kind of recovery? And that piece I can't really talk to yet because I think there's a fair chance, for example, that Myers may never come back into um, business because it, um, it's trading at 10 cents per share at the moment. A few years ago, it was $3 a share. So we're going to see some structural change here. Um, so there'll be, there'll be a, a sentiment-based recovery and then there'll be a structural one, which could take a bit longer. Now, having said that, Every government around the world is spending more money than ever before in history to, to, to rebuild the economies. They're doing it in two ways. Firstly, let's give money to the people so that they go out and spend, right? That's happening through the uh, settling payments that we're talking about there and the job seeker support. And there's, a, there's another one coming, uh, a job seeker supplement thing coming through the employer. And then there'll be the structural recovery where the, the banks, will be instructed to lend money to businesses to keep them afloat. There will be um, government spending programs like Kevin 07 did in the GFC. It wasn't brilliant, it wasn't perfect, but it did work. And it kept this country in uh, out of a recession uh, when the rest of the world went through a recession in the GFC. So if you, if you take as a given that these kind of economic um, crises do cause economies to slow down for six or 12 months. The reality is government intervention, like we saw in 2008 and nine, really does work. And it only takes six to 12 months to work. So three months, we're dealing with the fear and uncertainty. Six months, we're dealing with the inje massive injection of capital through the Centrelink payments and employer payments. And six to 12 months, 
you're going to find the government spending and the, and the infrastructure programs and everything that are coming down the pipe, they will support this country quite strongly. So um, I can't comment on whether the world will return to normal. I don't know if it'll return exactly to normal, but I have a very strong sense of confidence, Mick, since it was your question, that we're going to see a very different world in 12 months time. The impact on the USA, they are, there's no question about it, they're about 30 days behind where they should have been. However, China is about to open up again for business. America and China will now sort out their trade difficulties. China, in, in opening up again for business, they want two or three things. They want energy. Now the oil price is cheap, we've covered that in our last seminar. They want coal to make steel and they'll want steel or iron ore. Fortunately, Australia sells energy, coal and steel or iron ore. So Australia's recovery is gonna be far more correlated with China than it will with America in the early stage. The, the reality of the share market is it's more strongly correlated with um, Europe and the US. Um, and I think that we're not going to be too disappointed with the stock market in about three to six months time. So Mick, I hope that sort of answers your question. Um, there is one slide I wanted to show here, and this was from a review yesterday that I had with a client. Uh, I've taken his name out of the picture here, but he's, he's a classic investor. For the last couple of years, the 12 month return for the year to March, 2019 was only 4%. The, the 12 month return to the same period as of yesterday, for this client was actually minus 3%, okay? It's not that these minus 20s and things didn't happen, they did, but the way we balance your portfolio means that we're not actually necessarily heavily invested in only the share market. So the, um, the truth is, had we met this client back in um, January or February, his returns for the year were plus 12, plus 15, even plus 18%. Now they're minus three, but they're still only minus three for the year. So majority of our clients that we're seeing in their portfolios are only seeing single digit negative returns at the moment, not what the media is telling you on TV. So I hope that that introduces an element of confidence here. Um, we're not seeing quite the negative that, um, that the media is portraying. Now, David, you asked a question, how long will the reduced minimum pension amount be eligible for? Yeah, the answer is two years, David. Um, and to be honest, <laughs> they could change that next week. The, um, the, these are the account-based pensions that Chris was referring to. They've dropped it now to 2%, 3%, 4%, depending on your age profile. They will keep it down for another 12 months, at least after this financial year. But I think we're looking at a two-year window for the minimum pension amount. On the surface, that looks a little scary for retirees, but the truth is the cost of living's kind of dropped a little bit lately because we can't go anywhere or do anything. So um, I think we're going to find that, that that works. And I would encourage you where possible to maybe take pressure off your investments and if you can, just reduce your pension for six or 12 months because I think we're going to see a stronger second half of the year here. And that's where you want to have minimised any money you've withdrawn from your pensions for now. Um, are there any other questions that anyone's got? Chris, you're still there? Yep. All yeah, right. I can't see any other questions. Okay, pending that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, please give us some feedback. I hope this has been valuable. We intend to do it every week at um, 9 or 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. But of course, um, please, give us a ring at any time. Um, we're working from home for the most part. The offices are in fact open, where one or two members of staff are still working in the offices, mainly because I think their house is noisy in their office and they'd rather spend time with the office than, <laughs> than be at home. But um, if there is anything urgent, if you do need money in a hurry, if you really do need to talk to us, um, if something's sort of grabbed your soul and, and it's just eating away at you, we, we're here, um, I'm going out to see a client at home this afternoon. We're trying very much to obey the social distancing rules, but, but the rules permit us at the moment to, um, to visit with our clients one-on-one, -on -one, so we're more than happy to do that. 
or to take phone calls or to do Zoom meetings like this. So um, thank you everybody for, for um, tuning in. Um, feedback's always good. We want to know that we're on the mark. Um, I hope, uh, as Mick says, stay home, stay safe, wash your hands. Um, I agree with that very much. Um, this is a weird time. I, I won't kid anybody. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But I do like looking at graphs because when they start to curve, they all curve in the same direction. And that's a positive thing. I know that I was talking to someone in South Korea just the other day. I'll check in with him later today. But his mood was that South Korea is opening for business very quickly. And I know the same thing is happening in China as we speak. So um, they're all positive. Thank you very much. Take care. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Thanks, guys.